Hello friends, here's your daily update on Ukraine. We're going to start with the Institute for the Study of War yesterday, and we're going to start here for a reason. Um, this is really important to understand. It said Russians, uh, Russian officials are preparing for further covert mobilization efforts, even as the fall conscription cycle is underway. So what's that telling you is that Russia has not given up its ambitions to wage this war or whatever their maximalist goals are. They're, they're still thinking about that. Um, so that's the only thing I want to point out from the ISW, but they haven't thrown in the towel. They're not even thinking anything near there. They're thinking that they're getting the upper hand as they go into the winter and they're going to freeze out Ukraine and they're going into the winter and they're going to make it rough on uh, Western allies because of an inflation and things caused by the war that are jacking up prices. Uh, in the meantime, the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain, his name is Rishi Sunak. I'm, I'm really impressed with the guy, at least with his rhetoric uh, at the G20. I, I was very, I was deeply impressed by what he had to say there. Um, he made a surprise visit to Kiev on Saturday. <laughs> and um, the article goes on and talks about their, their discussion. But uh, here, what's important is that they, they talked about uh, air defense. And while Ukraine's armed forces uh, succeeded in pushing back Russian forces on the ground, civilians are being brutally bombarded from the air. We are today, this is Sunak talking, we are today providing new air defense, including anti-aircraft guns, radar, anti-drone equipment, and stepping up humanitarian support for the cold, hard winter ahead, said Sunak. So they're they're delivering a uh, air defense package. Now, why is this important? Well, Russia is trying to exhaust Ukraine's anti-air defenses, uh, says a Pentagon official. And so Russia's surge in missile strikes in Ukraine is partially designed to exhaust Kiev's supplies of air defenses. Uh, and so they've just gotten a bunch of air defenses from Britain. So that strategy isn't going to work like they were thinking. They shot 100 missiles on the, what was it, the 15th, the day that the Poland, the missile went into Poland, they shot a, a 90 missiles and it wasn't 100 missiles, I stand corrected, 90 missiles and 11 drones or something like that. It was the single worst day for that kind of thing. Uh, and they're trying to exhaust it. And uh, to their credit, Ukraine has learned and evolved and grown and has shot down 85% of those. Um, but they're still getting damage along the way. Ukraine's restored the train service to recaptured southern city of Herzon. And so that's good news. But what was interesting about this article was what was down here. When you start to dig into the article, Russian troops are digging trenches and fortifications along the river's east bank. So we, we would expect that there would be a line of fortification very close to the river, across the river. But there's a second line right behind it. So they're expecting... now. Uh, the the Russians are, are are expecting to defend against that and there's a difference between being on offense and defense on on defense like if you ever played the game risk if you're on defense you know that you have an advantage as opposed to being on offense and so um it's going to be a very dangerous thing. Like you've gotten this ground across the river, but now you've got to decide how much it's worth to actually go take it or where it's worth to take it. Um, and because it's, it's going to be painful, it's going to be um, very costly to uh, take that head on. Okay, next, enemy transfers paratroopers from Herzon region to Luhansk. And here we see Surya Heyde. Heyde, we remember from the Servodonetsk and Lusachansk, uh, when those uh, cities were falling, he was in charge of, he was the governor of uh, Luhansk, and he was very much trying to coordinate what was going on at the time. Uh, the remaining best soldiers of the Russians are transferring paratroopers from Herzon to Luhansk. And so the next battlefield is going to be off in Luhansk. Luhansk and, Herzon, um, Luhansk and Donetsk. Kurzan is just stable, and neither side's going to be taking it for a while. They both have to keep some, some troops on either side, but it can be fairly minimal. On the other side of that, because and they can be fairly minimal because there's a river separating. But on the other side, the Russians really need to take take land in Donetsk to like prove that they are doing something. And so there has been no alleviation of hostilities or respite. About a hundred Russian attacks were repelled in Donetsk region only yesterday. They just keep throwing these people at them. In the past 24 hours, the defense forces repelled the attacks of the Russian occupation forces near and they named a number of these cities uh, in the. Donetsk region. Now, where is that? It's over here. This is yesterday. Now, look right in here on the map. 
Okay, and you'll see very minor change. See that, that little tiny, I'm going back and forth, see that little tiny change? That's what's what's changed here in Donetsk. Um, and But the Russians just keep throwing their men at them because they have they have more men than they probably have ammunition. I mean, they have plenty of, of uh, bodies to throw that direction and they're not really worried about it. So wave after wave will just keep descending upon the Ukrainians. Ukraine's war will be over by the end of the spring, the country's deputy defense minister predicts. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I would love for that to happen. That would be, uh, my dream would be that it would be done by Christmas, but I, I don't think it'll be done. I, I think the Russians show me no indication that they're going to back away, that they're going to back down. They're still recruiting, as we showed you earlier, and I showed you that for this reason. Uh, but Volodymyr Havrilov, a retired major general, said his country would never stop fighting until a victory had, hadn't factored in even the potential of a Russian nuclear strike. Um, the Ukrainians, I got to give them to them. They're hardcore, right? I mean, they're they're going to keep at it. It doesn't matter what kind of scenario is on the table. People have played, paid a lot of blood, a lot of efforts is what we have already achieved. And he he's absolutely right. I mean, they're, they're just going to keep at it. He said, finally, they're... Um, they're they uh they're interested in just making a pause in this war to regroup the Russians to bring more people from the motherland. That's the dream. That's why we have no right to stop. And I think that's exactly right. The Ukrainians' mentality is we have to keep going. We have no right to stop. Stop. We have to get this. And this is this is my position as well. They have to have a this decisive military victory so that Ukraine is for uh, so that Russia is forced to negotiate and come to terms and ha has to be able to open its borders and return Ukrainians that have been removed across the Russian borders and uh, pay reparations and whatever else. Now, what have they achieved so far? Ukraine, I showed this yesterday as well. This was November 14th, just a few days ago. Ukraine has reclaimed 54% of the land Russia has captured since the beginning of the war. That is freaking incredible. Um, I'm not sure how much real estate exactly this was, but before this offensive and before this offensive, it was something like the, the size of uh, Denmark or something, I mean, amazing like that. I, and I remember seeing that just like months ago before we got this and this to um, to actually reclaim that ground. That's how much ground they had reclaimed up here. Okay, next, uh, in Eastern Poland. Now, what's, what's really interesting about this war is that it, uh, the Russians... The, the, if the Russians' goal was to to um, prevent the spread of NATO and to keep Ukraine away from NATO and that kind of thing, they have failed miserably. And they will fail when they ultimately fail because uh, Ukraine will go into NATO and this will never happen again because this could only happen because they were not in NATO. Um, Finland and Sweden have joined NATO in the meantime. And that, I mean, that's greater real estate than, than the country of Ukraine. So, I mean, it's just been devastatingly bad. The consequences. But this article here in The Guardian was talking about uh, in eastern Poland, Putin's war has uh, turned former enemies into friends. And that's right, because if you roll back the clock a couple of generations, um, or just a couple of generations ago, there was bitter fighting between the Poles and the Ukrainians. That, that's exactly right. And now they're they're together, and they're together because the common enemy does, nothing draws people together like a common enemy. And February 24th, uh, people, uh, forced people to see what we have in com common, was this common enemy. It's clear to Poles and Ukrainians that Russia is the aggressor. And that's exactly right. That's, that's what's happened here. Uh, next article, the U.S. says Russia's Ukraine invasion offered preview to the potential of global tyranny. So the more I think about it, the more I realize that what's really going on in the world is the same song, just another verse. And it's, this is our generation's version of this. Um, uh, you roll back the clock to when NATO was formed and their generation had this same kind of thing with Soviet aggression. And, you know, my grandchildren will probably have to face some kind of aggression somewhere in the world. But stopping it from spreading now is the lesson that we can we are uh, able to draw from what happened uh, within the last generation or two. And so this is why we're acting as we are. A Russian's invasion of Ukraine has offered a preview of a possible world of tyranny and turmoil, said the U.S. Secretary of Defense. These aren't just lapses. These aren't exceptions to the rule. These are atrocities. Russian missile barrages have left innocent Ukrainians without heat, water, electricity. Okay. Innocence. Civilians. This isn't what's supposed to be happening. Soldiers are supposed to fight soldiers, not children. 
Children killed. Hospitals bombed. How many children killed? Well, so far, there's 400 children killed in war to date, according to Reuters. That's that we know of. And now, these are non-combatants, clearly, by any definition. And this should never have happened. And it's uh, yesterday I talked about, wait, like, which side are the good guys? The, the good guys are the side that's not killing children. That That's probably a fair way of understanding it. Okay. Um... Okay, so most APEC members condemned the war in Ukraine. APEC is another, so you had a G20 that met just a few days ago. APEC is another, um, it's the Asian Pacific um, uh, organization. It's it's an economic uh, group that's going to try to, you know, work out treaties and things along those lines. And they have put out a statement as well about, you know, 21 members of the Asian Pacific Economic Corporation a Forum issued a joint declaration on November 19th after a day of half talks in Bangkok criticizing the conflict and the global economic turmoil unleashed. Now, it really, this war has had a detrimental effect all over the world. Now, it's obviously worse in Ukraine, but inflation is rampant. Now, inflation was going to be a product of COVID and we were going to get some, but it's, it's, accelerated that in other places. Japan has, rec I saw this as one of the articles as I was screening my articles. Japan has record high inflation since like 1982 or something along those lines. And so, I mean, so they're being hit there as well. South Korea is feeling it. Uh, all over the world, we are feeling the results of this to one degree or another. But no, nowhere worse than in Ukraine. I'm going to show this uh, probably at the end of most of these. Support Ukraine. If you go to UA support Order.com backslash Gertis. Go buy something here to support a Ukrainian who's making his income by doing this. He was smart enough to approach me. I didn't approach him and said, hey, you're doing these videos. Could, would you would you be able to do this and, and show this? This is how he's making his living now. And I think this is wonderful. If you also like go into my comments and you can see uh, the link for it. If you want to give to a nonprofit, I have a link and I've had a link since every video I've done here so far was to Samaritan's Purse. It's it's a legitimate charity that will make sure those are the guys behind the Christmas boxes thing uh, every year. Um, and so go and give to them. But as a, as a management professor, I'm more than happy to see a, somebody working and building his own income in order to survive. So uh, I think that's great. Listen, thank you for your time. If you have questions, I'd like to hear your questions. What, what would you like me to address? Uh, tell me and I'll see if I can try to work those kind of things in. I, when I read your comments, I try to be intentional about uh, focusing on those things. And thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.